Welcome to my presentation. Um, I know it's a weird topic to, to be discussing Mexico in post-Soviet context, but I'm sure that uh, as I progress you will find it less weird by the minute. Um, what I want to discuss today is not only the Mexican case, but also how uh, the Mexican institutions, the government, managed to re-engage with the Mexicans abroad, which I think it's a subject that might be useful for uh, the Mid-Bal countries. Um, so, I'm going to switch now to the, uh, to the presentation. This presentation will have three parts. Uh, the first part will be a brief introduction to what is uh, this uh, diaspora engagement policy. The second part will be the actual case, and the third part will be how to integrate the, the Mirupal experience with the, um, with, with the engagement policies from the diaspora. Um, this first part uh, will be very quickly. Uh, I'll try to keep it on under 10 minutes, and it will focus on five questions. Um, these five questions, I'll go one by one, and the first one is, of course, what does it mean to engage compatriots abroad? Um, as we know, migration implies the physical relocation of a person from their original place of residence to a new place of residence. Um, this process back in the 70s would cut all ties, with the exception of perhaps letters and very expensive phone calls. But in the 21st century, um, the ties, although are reduced, they are never cut off completely. To engage compatriots abroad means, uh, in general terms, to keep those ties with the homeland alive and constant, both for the benefit of the migrant, for the benefit of the country, and most uh, importantly for the, for, for the benefit of the community whence migrants originate. Um, on the one hand, uh, migrants sometimes do this by themselves. You know, they keep contacts with their families, with their friends, with their colleagues. Uh, but these ties are usually uh, very ad hoc ties, um, specific, and they have a very limited impact. Um, on the other hand, ties could be institutionally managed through diaspora engagement policies. Uh, for the purpose of, of this presentation, uh, diaspora engagement policies are decisions made and actions taken by governments and institutions on how to interact with their citizens abroad. Of course, this can be from different shapes and uh, from different uh, forms, uh, you know, from uh, almost personal decisions and actors in an individual capacity uh, to the creation of bureaucracies and departments and ministries or agencies with a fully institutionalized approach. Anything in between that can qualify as a diaspora engagement policy. Equally, uh, diaspora engagement policies may have different goals. They can try to foster interaction, uh, they can try to channel diaspora in one particular direction that is interesting to the government. Uh, the other way around, uh, a policy may try to, difficult, to, to make more difficult this interaction if they consider that the diaspora is hostile to its interests or even outright block it. Yeah? So, um, they Diaspora policies can take many shapes, and uh, they are sometimes planned, or they sometimes grow uh, organically uh, through the interactions of this uh, of this. Uh, diasporans or migrants with uh, the institutions back home, or sometimes it's a mix of both. Yeah? So that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, why is it important to engage uh, the diaspora? Well, uh, especially for the past 10 years, for the past decade or so, uh, we've had a growing uh, body of literature suggesting that an engaged diaspora can be a powerful 
resource that is very seldom tapped. Um, this tool could be harnessed for developmental purposes, and um, this development can come from very tangible and very uh, countable sources, such as remittances, uh, capital investments, uh, and so on. Or they can be very intangible, uh, such as knowledge, human capital, or other kind of social capital transfers. Um, through this past 10 years, we've discovered uh, a lot of case studies that go from China, India, the Philippines, Morocco, Mexico, and so on. Um, now, uh, attempts have been made to find the key institutional elements, you know, historical, political, economic conditions that are shared by countries who have successfully adopted these policies. Um, the problem is that um, all this research is very specific to the countries. Uh, this research focuses on usually one or two methodologies, either from political science or from demography or from uh, uh, sociology, and they don't share a common language, even in economy. The, the, the language of uh, economic migration is very different to the language used by sociologists to identify the same problem. So these studies have evolved in a very disconnected fashion. Um, and that's actually one of the reasons of why uh, diaspora engagement is a tricky business. Um, diaspora engagement is inextricably contextual. It is completely dependent on each country's political structure, migration structure, you know, big diaspora, the composition of it, you know, whether it's qualified or qualified, uh, whether it's a young or old, whether it's mostly male or mixed or mostly female, um, what are the main reasons behind immigration, if it's a matter of economic migration, if it's a matter of political migration, and uh, to which countries it goes, if it goes mostly to one country, if it goes to many countries, it just the complexity and the complicated uh, structure under which this uh, uh, under the, which these policies are based are just too many to fathom. Um, so this, together with uh, the specificity of the methodological language that different approaches have taken, makes it very difficult to make comparisons. Um, on top of that, if again we uh, we consider that the engaging diaspora may not always be desirable or positive, depending on the context, um, you know this uh, this is indeed a very very tricky business. But if it is so complicated, then how can I say that uh, there are lessons to be extracted from these countries? Well, mostly because I focus on two things. One of the things we focus on is the actors. There will always be migrants and there will always be institutions, no matter what, no matter where. And the second one is that there will always be an engagement process. There will always be the interaction between actors and institutions. And that's where we focus our attention. Those are the stable building blocks of diasporas. Uh, that's why we can cover uh, common ground to be able to build on international comparative research. Uh, how do we do that? We do it through a narrative structure. So we basically say uh, it all started in one fine morning of blah, and you know we build a story from there. Uh, now, uh, my idea to build this case is to use a mixed approach. So we try to use a common language for different uh, for different scientific disciplines. We will try to use sociology psychology, political science, behavioral economics, and all this under one banner. Uh, I'll explain more of this later on uh, on the methodological side. I won't go too much into detail, do not worry. I'll try to keep it as practical as possible. And there is just one last question that I would like to answer now, which is why the Mexican, uh, why the Mexican experience for, for, this, um, for this presentation? What for? Zachem, I think it is. In Russian, no? So, um, the Mexican experience is quite interesting because I think it mirrors very well what happens for some of the countries uh, of Mirpal. Historically, we have been a country of migrations 
since the mid 19th century. Uh, half of our territory uh, used to belong to what now is a different country and therefore we have a lot of people who identify themselves as Mexicans living in a different territory. Um, the migration has increased like never before over the past uh, 15 years and at some point the government did not care absolutely anything about it and only over the past let's say uh, 20 years this has changed so now the government is trying to reconnect with the um, with, with the diaspora so you will see that there are some very interesting parallels uh, with it and you know for Russia as well uh, the fact that now we have a stable middle class that is emigrating for qualified migration how the government is trying to uh, engage with these qualified migrants uh, is also very similar to experiences that, that we have. Hmm? Uh, in a sense, uh, maybe uh, the idea of saying, I'm, uh, I'm going ahead a little bit and I'm going to say that uh, around 12 million Mexicans live abroad. Uh, that compared to some countries is actually the whole population of some European countries. Uh, and it represents around 10% of Mexican total population. So that's to give you an idea. Maybe 10% doesn't sound too much to Armenians, of course, uh, but uh, you know, 12 million is a very sizable diaspora. So uh, let's go on to the case study. But before we do that, I'm going to ask your help. I would like to ask you to try to spot the similarities and differences of uh, your specific countries um, and the case study and also try to think of specific challenges that these policies could have uh, for your country. Uh, try to write them down either, I don't know, by, by individually or if you're uh, with several people in your countries, uh, like you can even have some sort of discussion about it while I'm talking, um, because it will be very enriching later to, to try to discuss the case uh, on the third part. So, no further ado, let's move to the um, second second part of the of the case uh, which is the actual engagement of uh, Mexicans abroad and whether if uh, we can see the, a, a new era on it it all started uh, in the middle of the 19th century when we lost a war with the United States and uh, we lost uh, over half of our territory and uh, you know this territory was not overly populated but a lot of people who were there uh, had ties with the rest of the country so this could be considered like the first uh, uh, cross-border relations that we had with, uh, with a huge part of the community abroad and at some point uh, during the second half of this 19th century the government tried to build railroads uh, to try to connect the more urbanized southern part to the northern part of the country uh, where those communities used to be. Uh, curiously, simultaneously, the railroads were developed around the same areas in the United States. So it was a top-down and bottom-up process. Um, around the same time, uh, there was a big scare in the U.S. Uh, to Asian migration. They started restricting restricting the Asian migration in the U.S. and they were even, these Chinamen were even seen as, uh, as the yellow peril. It was uh, a bit of how it was expressed uh, in the policy. And therefore, you know, all these Mexicans were welcome uh, handiwork for the United States. Uh, the problem is that at some point, at the beginning of the 20th century, in 1910, uh, the Mexican uh, had a huge civil war, a revolution, a Mexican revolution, which decimated a big part of the country. Uh, and a big part of a population. And a lot of people having ties across the border decided to flee north. This is the first era of state diaspora engagement. Yeah? Uh, this era, this era of mass migration or open borders would change with one uh, development at the end of the 1920s and the beginning of the 1930s. This development would be, of course, 
the uh, Great Depression. The Great Depression uh, basically meant that the United States uh, had uh, a lot of unemployed people in ur in urban areas. It meant that, uh, you know, it was uh, dire straits economically. But it also happened at the same time of another phenomenon called the Dust Bowl. The Dust Bowl uh, was a meteorological phenomenon that decimated huge agricultural areas in the United States. So not only the urban uh, uh, population was jobless, also the rural population was jobless. And what and what happens in this kind of uh, in this kind of uh, times? Of course, mass deportations. All those Mexicans, even if they had been uh, living in the United States uh, legally, even if they had been born in the United States, in many cases, were massively deported. Uh, just to give you uh, an idea, this is more or less the time when the Border Patrol consolidates and the Immigration uh, Department consolidates. Uh, and these massive deportations go on until 1942. What happens in 1942? Well, 1941 actually. 1941, what happens? Uh, the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor and the United States enters the Second World War. So now they need the hands. Now they need the work, right? What happens is that we signed bilateral agreements for uh, what, you know, it's commonly known as gastarbeiters, a guest worker problem. And uh, in the beginning, people are kind of scared. Uh, this program uh, attracts, you know, not many people, but enough. And as the years went on of this uh, program, by the end of it, people were flooding the United States in the hundreds of thousands. Um, now, this program had two effects. It encouraged legal migration, but it also encouraged illegal migration because uh, they were more flexible migrants and they were easy to, uh, they were easy to, um, uh, to the port if you don't need the migrant anymore instead of giving severance pay you just call the migration department and say hey I have uh, useless migrants here deport them back to their country and the program is called Bracero why is this? Uh, because in Mexico or in Spanish Brazo means arm as uh, you can see uh, by the kind of labor they were doing, they were extensively using their arms. So these brazos were uh, the reason of why this program was called Bracero. Uh, just to give you an idea, this is how the program Bracero uh, works. Uh, we are, uh, oh, I, I only now notice that we lost uh, the content. Uh, should be, we should be back in a second. Uh, there we go. So, I was showing this image and why Bracero is called Bracero, because, you know, it's labor-intensive with the arms, with the brazos. Uh, now, I want to show you this graph, because this is pretty cool. This is how it begins, this program Bracero. It begins with very, very few people signing up. But at some point, uh, the word of mouth is spread, and you see that there is a humongous growth of this need of, uh, of Bracero. Uh, at the same time, uh, by the end of this Bracero program in, in, in 1964, uh, there, is a, there is a reduction. Why is there this reduction? Because of a change, a game-changing thing that is the mechanization of the United States agriculture. You know, more machines in the, in the fields, less hands required. And by the end of 1964, the program ends and no more guest workers are allowed. However, people had already gotten the taste of working abroad. And if they were not going to go there legally through a guest working problem, they would go there illegally. Um, here is uh, a bit of a longer perspective. This is how it grew all the way until the Mexican Revolution. This is the, the, the massive deportations uh, era that we were talking about, and again, the Bracero program. So it gives you an idea of how uh, the, the curve has progressed. Yeah? Then we go to the fourth era, the no policy policy. Uh, during this period, Mexican government virtually decides to ignore 
whoever is outside of Mexico. It's not only something that happened towards migrants, it's something that happened in general. It, it happened because there was a program of import substitution. Um, we tried to develop our, uh, our industry and so on, and therefore uh, the industry was um, was uh, the key to get a bigger middle class. This bigger middle class would be reflected here in this graph. You see the salary, the average salary of a Mexican worker. So after the Bracero program, somewhere around here, you see the huge increase of salaries of Mexico in real terms. This also means that the, the middle class expanded and people were less willing to go abroad. So, um, with this idea in mind, you know, why would you focus your efforts in uh, engaging Mexicans abroad? Who cares? Nobody, huh? from the policy terms. But then something happened suddenly in uh, in the begin in, in, in the in the late 19 mid 1970s, late 1970s, and that is two or three recurrent crises. One, the oil crisis. If you consider that Mexico had around 80 percent of its gross domestic product dependent on oil and oil derivative exports, um, the crash obviously hit them pretty hard. And you can see here also the effects on the Mexican salaries. If you add that to recurrent fiscal crisis and debt crisis, uh, you know, the, 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 the hit that the Mexicans took uh, during this, during this uh, period of time is very, very obvious. Let's focus on this part. So between uh, 76 and uh, this graph is until uh, 95, you can see a steady decline of the average uh, salary of a Mexican worker. Uh, it kind of was cut two thirds. Uh, and what happens is that migration explodes in the 70s, obviously, for obvious reasons. Between 70 and 90, the migration goes from uh, around less than 1 million to over 4 million. Yeah? Uh, it's, uh, if you, if, this is only the people who migrated during this area. If you consider that people had been living there and obviously having families and having children, this number, instead of 4 million, can go all the way to uh, 15 million. 15 million Mexicans living abroad uh, with, uh, with the consideration of uh, second generation migrants. Huh? So when you have 4 million of Mexicans and 15 million of second generation Mexicans abroad, it just becomes impossible to ignore. Huh? And we have a fifth era, an era where the government realizes that it's needed to recognize that we have Mexicans abroad. And this era uh, would start around, 1980, uh, around 1988, so very late 1988. Um, just to give you an idea, this is a progression of this era. Uh, legal migration stays uh, very stable all the way until 2000, but illegal migration grows steadily. Um, all during this era, before we stayed over here in the graph, now you see an almost uh, exponential progression of this migration uh, going to 14 million, mi uh, to 12 million migrants, and if we count second generation migrants, up to 33 million migrants. And uh, the remittances that these migrants sent between 97 would go from 5 billion all the way to 25 billion. They would be multiplied in five. Yeah. So there is a big power behind this migration in economic terms. There is a big power of this migration in demographic terms. And uh, why am I talking about the United States all the time? Well, because this uh, because this graph shows you that 97.9, so almost 98 percent of Mexicans live in the United States. Uh, the reminder, 1.2 percent lives in other places in uh, America, be it Canada or South America. Uh, eight, less than 1 percent lives in Europe, and uh, a very, very small amounts live in Asia and, and Africa and Oceania. So uh, 98 percent of Mexicans live in the United States. That way, that's why we have such a dependency from, uh, from, this, uh, from these policies.
So let's go to the uh, fifth era very, very quickly. And why fifth era? Because this one is where the real, uh, the real engagement starts. Um, it starts with a precedent that would be very smart in a sense. He said, okay, we depend on the United States so heavily. Why don't we actually <coughs> sign a free trade agreement with them? And, uh, you know, that will help us uh, kind of improve. And at the same time, let us try to reduce poverty. But since the poverty reduction comes where the migrants are, let's try to engage the migrants with it. And while we engage the migrants with it, since migrant organizations in the U.S. are rather politically engaged, we can get their support for this free trade agreement. So he goes and tries to engage the migrants. He, de he develops a program uh, for poverty reduction called Solidaridad, and he develops programs to try to help migrants every time they visit, that you know, they would not be abused in the border and so on. He develops uh, uh, programs to match the funds of remittances that the migrants would say in their communities so that, you know, they would have some impact in the communities. And uh, he would develop even programs to have migrants where they're living abroad to get some services like health uh, services vaccination campaigns um, since they're illegal migrants in the US they don't have the services right so if they go to the Mexican consulate they can get the services or even things such as textbooks um, you have a kid in the US that goes to a US school but maybe you want him to learn Spanish so we give them textbooks in Spanish so they can keep on learning uh, their ancestral language and keep, have ties to their culture this gamble pays off, and when the time comes to negotiate this free trade agreement, the guy gets his way. The migrants go behind it, and they, uh, they participate, and they are actually very politically involved in order to get this agreement signed. Once he got what he wanted, he kind of kept the programs, but he basically never engaged the migrants again. But the migrants themselves started engaging. They started organizing organizing themselves. The next president comes and he says, hey, uh, we have a kind of an issue with the United States uh, because the United States are becoming very vocal against uh, uh, Mexicans. You know, the United States are getting very aggressive towards the political activities that the Mexicans abroad are having. And they're trying to have their, um, their residence permits revoked. But but, you know, since in the U.S., if you get a residence permit revoked, you basically don't have citizenship, and Mexico didn't allow double citizenship, the government says, hey, what if we give them double nationality, and what if we give them uh, the chance to, you know, adopt uh, U.S. citizenship, but also keep their Mexican citizenship? You know, in that way, at least they would have something to fall back on if worse comes to worse. Uh, and that's how the second nationality is enacted in Mexico. Um, and while this happens, of course, if you are a national abroad, then that means that you can vote, right? The law actually allows for this to happen, but very smartly, they did not pass how to do it. So you're a, you're a migrant, you're abroad, you can vote, but to do it, you have to come back to Mexico and do it. Candidates pick up on this, and the opposition candidates start campaigning in the United States to try to get the migrants to convince people in Mexico to vote for them. You know, you cannot vote, but you can convince your comrades to vote for us. And uh, one of them even goes as far as saying, if you vote for me or if I win, I am going to make sure that you can vote from abroad. This guy basically didn't have a clue of the kind of beast he was waking up. And politically, in Mexico, the, my, the, the, the fact that the migrants can vote, that would be unthinkable. You know, they left Mexico. Let them be away, you know. Uh, oh, if they want to go away, let them go away. Uh, but this guy actually uh, got his wish granted, and he was elected president. So now he had to make good on his promise. And the migrants were actually very smart in saying, hey, you know what, before we had a president that offered us everything we wanted, 
And then when he got what he wanted, he just forgot about us. So that is not going to happen again. If you want to keep us supporting Mexico, you will have to keep supporting us. But not just like a policy tool, but you'll have to keep supporting us like engaged citizens. So this guy comes up with a way to, you know, make a, a presidential office and this presidential office failed and he decides to try to create another thing and ask the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to kind of find a way to, you know, negotiate a way in which they can sit to the table but participate, you know, in a way that the, the rest of the government would listen. And someone in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs thinks, huh, if we are diplomats and what we do is mediate, why don't we actually mediate between the migrants and the government? And they create some sort of task force that would be in charge of this mediation. Migrants, instead of going to each ministry and say, hey, we need these, we want that, they would go to one specific institution, and this specific institution would have to talk to a council made of different uh, ministries so that these ministries would be in charge of uh, enacting those solutions. And that's how the Institute of Mexicans Abroad is born. Uh, I'm not going to go into depth, but let me just say that the first year this institute uh, happened, uh, the, 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 the recommendations that the migrants sent were over 110 policy changes across every single item of the government's agenda, from education to health to, you know, the, before they said, oh, yeah, you gave me books, textbooks in Mexican, but you know what really would help my, my kids in the U.S. is to have textbooks in English, you know so that they don't feel that they are second-class citizens in the U.S., so that they don't feel that they have a handicap. So you as Mexican government, if you really want me to, to improve my life standards here in the U.S., help me learn English, not Spanish. Spanish I know, I can teach my kids Spanish in my family, help them learn English. Um, you know, you're very stingy on how you give me money for my remittances. If I send money back home, you tell me, oh, but it has to be used to build a hospital. But what if, you know, what we really need in my community is a church? What if what we really need in my community is a sports center? You know, these may not be important for you as a government, but it's important for me to build a sense of community in my community. So all these kind of programs were amended by migrant, uh, by migrant ideas. And of course, at the beginning, the rest of the government would think, okay, yeah, now we have to talk to the migrants, and yeah, now we have to tell them whatever they want, sure, we'll just tell them yes, but not act upon it. Thinking about that, the government actually passed a law that this engagement had to be um, twice a year. So twice a year, migrants and government would meet and not only see what had been done, but to assess the progress. And, you know, when you have remittances growing five times over this period, you better keep track of what they're doing, otherwise the migrants might stop sending remittances and and the government might actually need to look for alternative sources of funding. So this power that the president had awoken uh, unthinkingly uh, was now being felt all across the government. Um, I'm not going to go into every single one of these slides, but here uh, what I would like you to, to, to see is how in the beginning, so in the, in the previous era, this context between migrants and government are kind of sparse. But towards the later years, or after the creation of this Institute of Mexicans Abroad, contacts are not just twi twice a year. Contacts are really, really frequent. Because once the dialogue became established, the government realized that the, the migrants were not uh, that uh, unrealistic in what they were asking. They were actually asking very sensible stuff. And uh, that what the effect this was having on the communities was actually very, very uh, real. Uh, poverty was really becoming uh, alleviated in the poor communities and migrants were actually being very, very active. Uh, so this is uh, why I would say that instead of having uh, five uh, eras, 
we should actually have six eras. A fifth era that ended in 2000 and the sixth era that ended in 2000 when these Mexican migrants woke up and decided to stop being policy, subje uh, policy objects and became subjects, became engaged in the actual generation of these policies. Um, and uh, that's pretty much uh, the story of Mexico, how a government who was initially very close to migrants discovers that, uh, you know, they're an untapped source of actual usefulness, how migrants who were completely dislocated with their native land actually realize that they can have an impact and they can have uh, a developmental potential. And um, what I'm going to go on now is I'm going to go on to the third part of the case and tell you how, you know, th this, this storyline that I just told you is not just a storyline that you get items and that's it. This storyline has a methodology behind it. And I'm going to tell you a bit about this methodology uh, and maybe this will help you to keep on thinking of those similarities of those differences, uh, of those challenges uh, that um, that uh, we that we have that we that I ask you to think about in the beginning and that we will discuss uh, towards the end of the third part. Yeah? Um, so part three, uh, how to to extract these lessons. Hmm? Um, I like to think of a methodology as a multi-layer thing. Uh, if you think, to use a metaphor or to use a, a, a simile, uh, think of an office, any office. Any office has uh, departments and people and uh, areas where people meet and so on and so forth. But what every office has is key people. These key people are those who are the leaders, the movers and you know maybe it's a leadership because they're charismatic people or maybe because they are like the boss you know? uh, and these bosses actually have a team and every office has different departments with different teams you know? that's the second level first level key actor second level team now teams often interact these teams interact uh, and they can be in a very cooperative relation they can be in a very conflictive relation uh, and that's a third level the actual level of interaction mm -hmm. then you know what happens with this interaction is not only uh, the problem of the teams sometimes it's external things that affect these teams but within the office so there is this fourth level and that is the system the policy system level and of course there's general things that happen around you know whether the economy or whatever that affects even the decisions and that is a fifth level a very macro level so we have five levels that are one inside the other pretty much like a matryoshka doll so if we think of a matryoshka doll uh, where the smallest one is the actor and the biggest one is the case study methodology, what I have done is I have taken five different methodologies from different cultures. Uh, these methodologies, again, come from psychology, come from behavioral, policy, uh, behavioral economics, come from sociology, and what I have done is try to make the language of these methodologies standardized under one single framework. Uh, this is how the framework looks like, and this is how this case study that I just told you was built. Prior events, the episode of engagement, contemporary events, uh, later events. So it's extremely, uh, uh, it's extremely complicated in a sense of how it looks. But as you can see, it generates a very clear narrative where you can see uh, how um, how the interaction happens, and this clear. Uh, narrative of how interaction happens is what can uh, be uh, done for different countries. Using the same methodology means that you can compare different countries. Yeah? So that's why I would suggest something like this if uh, at some point we want to check how the diaspora engagement policies are across the different MIRPOL countries, we can do something like this. 
apply it and generate a case narrative for each of them yeah, with the specificities. So that's it from my end. Um, I think that uh, it's now time to go to your ideas, to your questions, and to, 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 to this idea on how these policies that I've been discussing today can help, or these lessons that, um, that we can extract from your countries can help um, your different organizations. Thank you, Juan, for such a bright and interesting presentation. I liked uh, especially much the history of migration uh, from Mexico, although the methodology looked uh, uh, a little bit uh, complicated to me, at least that uh, uh, matrix looked uh, very busy. So I'm afraid there will be some questions concerning that matrix. So colleagues, uh, I suggest we start with Kishinev, uh, uh, Moldova. If you have any um, questions or ideas, and Juan will be very happy to answer your questions. I would like to give the floor to the uh, employee of the Bureau on uh, Diaspora Engagement uh, that is, reports to the Government of Republic of Moldova uh, near the Chancellor's Office, uh, in the Chancellor's Office. And uh, uh, I'll give the floor to Anarina. She'll have the question. Speak in English. So my question is, how do you... Uh, how do you attract migrants to get involved more in different activities? And I'm not speaking about only um, uh, about uh, cultural events, and uh, uh, but uh, different activities to to get, to get their interest to to be more involved in uh, the country uh, develop uh, to develop the country. Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, I... So we do have some experience. We uh, we organized some uh, uh, some events uh, uh, as uh, uh, economic forums or congresses. Or uh, 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 last year we did organize uh, diaspora days, uh, but it's kind of complicated to um, to get to them, you know, to, to attract them to, to, to get more involved. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. This is my question. Questions? Or from, uh, from Moldova? Or? No, this is it. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, quick answer. This is the only question I have. Okay, um, I'll answer really quickly. Uh, policies can go in two ways. You can actually uh, attract, uh, policies can go from the institutions towards the migrants, but if there is no uh, organization in the migrants themselves, uh, these policies will be very difficult to, to enroute. Yeah. So, um, one of the first steps that Mexico had to do in our experience was to actually build migrant organizations. Uh, in our case, they happened or they evolved organically. Since uh, during this no policy policy era, the government completely ignored them, the migrants organized themselves. And they organized themselves in a way in which they would be protected in the places where they lived. Now, when the government came to them, the first reaction, of course, was completely um, mistrust or outright even hostility in some cases because you know you were the government who not only kicked me out of my country but you were also ignoring me all this time and now you want my help so that's why the government had to do something for the migrants in the beginning and that's when all this service provision starts to happen but the government had to do things that the migrants were interested in. So, yes, they gave them things like uh, all these vaccination campaigns and education textbooks and all, and all these kind of consular protection services that I was talking about. But at the same time, the government was doing things for their communities back home. So, not only things that, they, that, that would catch the attention of the migrants,
sense that we catch the attention of their communities. That's when they start with these match funding schemes for the remittances, um, you know, the, the, if the migrant sends, uh, for every dollar that migrant sends uh, back to their communities, the government will add one extra dollar uh, on a federal level and the province level would add another dollar, so it would be instead of the community receiving one dollar, they would receive three dollars, all these kind of schemes that are very common uh, in general. Huh? Uh, so to kind of summarize the answer that I'm giving to you first, uh, you have to organize the diaspora itself so that when the when the government tries to have some policies, uh, they, they, they have contact points uh, that will be uh, pooling the rest of the diaspora. Uh, secondly, try to find things that they actually want. It's not just what the government wants, but what the, uh, the government can really do for them. Uh, it's, it's this idea of changing the mentality of uh, you are the migrant, so you are the policy recipient. No. It's the other idea. You sit down with me and tell me what you want. And, you know, I may be able to give it to you. I may not agree with you, but at least we can get the dialogue started. And we can build trust little by little so that people will later come back to to this migrant office uh, for, for whatever you're offering them. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Um, I have something in addition to well, the scope of such programs uh, for diaspora engagement. Well, what kind of expenditures are we talking about? I mean, in dollar terms, uh, uh, annually, how much money uh, is spent on dollar in, uh, on uh, diaspora engagement policies? Because, uh, you know, some countries uh, would like to provide textbooks uh, to their migrants or something else, but uh, sometimes they are short of money to, to do that. Well, maybe Mexico had such an opportunity and had such, such money. Maybe you know something about the funding levels. Um, the funding levels uh, for Mexico were actually never um, accounted in such a way as to what was directed to migrants. Since all this, uh, since all this uh, social expenditure part was directed to different uh, ministries within the, within, within the government, I, I, maybe it has been accounted by, by research. If it has, I, I don't have the figure. I can try to find it out. But, you know, the, the, the same money that was directed to vaccination campaigns, a part of these vaccines was uh, sent to consulates or the, the textbooks that are given to Mexican children in Mexico, a part of these textbooks were sent to consulates. Uh, so the expenses as such, uh, I, uh, I, I don't have a figure right now and I'm not even sure if it has been, if it has been calculated. Clear, thank you. Now, our colleagues from Kyiv, maybe you have any questions there or ideas to share? So, uh, good afternoon. Would you please uh, describe the engagement mechanisms in more detail? Because we are not quite clear on that. Maybe you have some concrete examples of what kind of arrangements you have or mechanisms you put in place to engage the diasporas. Yes. I told you before, I'm, I'm going to go now a little bit more into detail of what I skipped earlier. Um, the, the, um, uh, it, it all happened through the consular network uh, of Mexico abroad. Uh, in Mexico, it's not obligatory to register at consulates. And uh, m more importantly, since a lot of the population was not residing there legally, would not dare to go to the consulate unless they had like some huge problem. So what the Mexican government did is they tried to get the, the consulate personnel 
out uh, to the communities. Um, they would try to get the consular personnel into the migrant organizations. And once they would visit the migrant organizations, they would ask all the migrants and say, hey, uh, there is this task force in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and they want to help you. But in order to help you, we cannot send everyone. We will have to elect some sort of representative council from the migrants. Uh, and, you know, if you want to have your voice heard in Mexico and actually make a difference, now is your chance. Uh, the different consular uh, offices in the United States contacted the migrant organizations this way. A lot of the migrant organizations said, you know what, uh, we've tried this before with previous administrations. It didn't work because, yes, they wanted our help, but then they started ignoring us again, so I'm not participating. But other migrant organizations said, you know what, I'm going to give you a chance, I'm going to participate. And they elected from the whole of the United States 190, 187 people. The elections of who was going to participate in this council uh, were uh, taken by each by each consulate. You know, the migrant organizations themselves would elect who would participate. The government had absolutely no influence on who would be participating, but they only had uh, influence on uh, how the process will will take place. And they only said, whoever you send, it'll just be a person that will be a counselor for three years. And after these three years, you will have to elect someone else. So every three years, this council would be uh, refreshed with, uh, with new people. Once they had this, this, uh, this council uh, set, they went to the ministries and by law, by a presidential decree, uh, the Council of uh, Mexican Attention was established. From every ministry, there would have to be one or two contact persons who would have to deal with migrant affairs. And these people would all sit down together in a room to deal with this council of migrants. But again, if you put people who don't understand each other, if they don't speak the same language, you needed the third leg. And this third leg was this task force within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the diplomats. And what the diplomats did was to mediate, um, mediate uh, this dialogue. This uh, mediated dialogue would be the migrants. Uh, the migrant. I'm going to switch to uh, to content. So maybe. A, a diagram would be clearer. So on the one hand, you have uh, the Migrants Council. On the other hand, you have the Ministry Council. And at the beginning, you have this Mexican Institute for Mexicans Abroad. So in the beginning, it would be a mediated dialogue. They would, they would talk, but they wouldn't hear each other very much. They wouldn't understand each other very much. So most of the relation would go through these diplomats. Uh, the diplomats would try to convince the government why what the migrants were uh, demanding was useful and interesting. Uh, at the same time, this uh, Institute of Mexicans Abroad would try to explain the migrants why it was important to listen to the government because, you know, some of the policies that they were thinking were actually uh, part of a bigger picture that the government uh, always has. And this mediation was in the beginning what made it work, what made the interaction work. Uh, as since they were meeting twice a year, uh, and for sometimes uh, the, 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 the policies were very, very detailed, instead of going through this whole mechanism, after they knew each other, they would just contact each other directly. Hey, Ministry of Social Development, uh, we wanted to have this uh, program of fund matching done differently. Um, these are our proposal. And then the Ministry of Social Development would say, oh, yeah, it actually sounds good, but you know, don't forget about this, don't forget about that. Once the, once the engagement is established, when the dialogue is established, then um, the interaction happens by itself and it doesn't have to be mediated. But this would be more or less the scheme of, of, of this interaction. Um, does that answer your question? Colleagues in Kiev, I wonder if you got the response to your question of 
Do you need any further clarifications? I'd like to ask for clarification. Now, this Institute uh, for Mexicans Abroad, what is the status of this entity? Is this a uh, public entity or uh, government entity? What is it? Um, Originally, it started as a presidential office, uh, an office devoid from uh, from personal, uh, from uh, juridical, uh, from legal personality. Uh, but this was actually not a very good idea, and it failed. It was a first approach. The second approach was to get it uh, as part of the diplomatic corps, so under the authority of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs chose those people who had been in charge of providing the services and they also chose uh, people who were uh, uh, in charge of uh, the different uh, connection with the different areas of government. They put them together into a task force and after the task force proved to be uh, valuable in this engagement, only after that this institute was created as a separate entity. It has its own uh, budget, its own personality, it's a public entity under the authority of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and more specifically under the uh, Vice Minister for North American Affairs. As we've seen, 98% of the Mexicans uh, are in the United States, so it, it falls under the tutelage of the Vice Minister for North American Affairs within MEAT. Would that solve your question? Thank you very much. Any further questions from Kiev or some comments or feedback? Not really, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Now let us move on to Dushanbe to Tajikistan. Your questions, your comments, please. Go ahead. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, please go ahead. Loud and clear. I'm uh, Chavite Kromov. I represent the Center for Strategic Studies. I got a comment and some questions I'd like to ask. You want us to say whether there are some similarities between Tajikistan and Mexico. Well, one similarity is that over 90% of uh, Tajiks are in one country only, that is Russia, of course. And uh, we also have been through some stages trying to reach out to our compatriots abroad. We uh, started those attempts uh, in earnest um, after 2010. We introduced a number of uh, pieces of legislation and regulations in order to improve the position of our compatriots abroad. And obviously this was triggered by the global financial crisis and uh, the fallout of the crisis. Now, perhaps I can uh, share with you some of uh, my ideas and uh, maybe I could hear from you as to your experience. Uh, you suggested that uh, a lot of Mexicans live in just one country, the United States. Now, the chicks are in Russia. Uh, and currently, we are in the following situation. Well, so far, our interaction uh, with uh, our Tajik uh, community has been disastrous. Now, I used to work uh, at the migration service at Tajikistan. We used to have uh, close to 81 independent communities uh, in Russia, Tajik communities. It was next to impossible to interact and deal with them. Now, you mentioned uh, your council. Now, this council of yours, the Council of Migrants, uh, as far as I understand, it is located in the United States, right? And it brings together all the communities, all the Mexican communities. I don't think it deals with just one group of compatriots. Obviously, it is a blanket kind of organization covering all Mexicans in the States, right? Those small communities spread uh, across the country. Now, could you tell us, please, how did you manage to bring them all together under one umbrella? I mean, so far, we've, we have not been able to achieve this. We're trying to devise a way to bring them all together, but we've uh, failed miserably so far. Now, uh, my second question about indicators. You uh, mentioned that 
uh, towards the stage six, somewhere around the year 2000, when you managed to improve your interaction with compatriots. Now, there must be some indicators uh, that uh, would reflect your performance in terms of uh, dealing with uh, uh, compatriots. For instance, we have a regulation whereby we consider uh, our compatriots as development partners. But so far, we've not been able to come up uh, with a way to bring in their investment so that to boost our development. However, we do know from international experience that uh, compatriots living abroad might have tremendous financial resources. So now the objective is how to tap those resources. Here comes my second question. Uh, how did you manage uh, to do that? Thank you. Now, colleagues, before Juan attempts to answer, please check your microphones and mute your microphones on the remote end before we see some interference in the channel. It's a uh, uh, real nuisance. Thank you. So you see, uh, that's why I was telling you that uh, even if it's a very remote uh, idea, the, the, the similarities could be striking uh, with, with uh, some of the Miripal countries. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with you that it's very difficult to try to bring different communities under one umbrella. And uh, here is where the contextual part of the, of the problem is. Um, what actually made these communities rally together and work together was that they saw that there was a presidential candidate that was looking for her help before he got elected, when he got elected, he actually really tried to deliver on his promise. Again, this uh, was not because the guy was a very nice person. He might be. I'm not saying that he isn't. But I think that it also had to do with the actual level of remittances that were being sent to Mexico that was well over $20 billion. Uh, and, of course, that had a big impact on the national uh, on the national budget, uh, which in Tajikistan, if I remember correctly, happens to be the country with the largest impact of this uh, of this um, in, in, in the domestic budget. So you do have that parallel in terms of power of diaspora. Now, all you need, very, simple, very simply done, of course, is to find a person within your political system that can rally the people and actually try to sit them at the table and try to fulfill this, uh, these promises. Not always has to be a person within the establishment. Here in Mexico, it was a huge help that it was someone from the establishment and someone who actually had the this, this political clout to, to push policies, but um, yeah, it, 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 the, the problem is exactly that. Mexicans abroad felt identified as Mexicans. Uh, they may be from different regions, they may be from uh, different backgrounds. You know, for example, a uh, Mexican diaspora that is, uh, let's say, highly skilled or highly qualified diaspora, uh, they don't come under this a council that I was talking about. They have a different network, uh, a talent network, but it's pretty much, it works exactly the same, and it also works through the same uh, Institute for Mexicans Abroad. So we do have a, a bit of a separation between low-skilled and high-skilled. Uh, not, not all of them come under the same banner, uh, mostly because their needs are different. Uh, the needs of someone who is uh, well integrated in the host society, the needs of someone who is uh, more concerned on how to transfer knowledge uh, is different to the need of someone who is fighting for survival in a hostile environment. So that's why they have them separate. And, you know, the, the networks were sep in separate ways, but pretty much with the same mediation, mediation of this Institute of Mexicans brought. Um, how they come together, again, it's, it's really political work. Uh, the Mexican government gave them something to aim for. They gave them something to sit, they, they gave them a seat at the table, they gave them respect during the conversations, and uh, not just the feeling they were being used. I think that is really the most important thing on how to bring them to the table. And then your second question is the question of indicators. Yes, uh, in my presentation I spoke of, of a sixth stage. This sixth stage has never been identified before. This is actually my contribution to, to 
to to this uh, storyline. Uh, it's my uh, idea that you know there is a, a, a qualitative change that is important enough to grant it its own uh, its own uh, era by itself. Now, uh, if you ask me for indicators, the first thing that comes to mind is of course the frequency and the quality of engagement, the frequency and quality of contacts between diaspora and institutions. Before 2000, uh, contacts would be sporadic and contacts would be ad hoc, so on a policy dependent basis. I need you, I give you, you need me, uh, you give me. That's it. After 2000, with the creation of this Institute of Mexicans Abroad, it doesn't really matter whether you need me or whether I need you, that is a given. We both need each other. So let's sit down as often as we need to and then we will get the ball rolling. Uh, um, for example, another indicator, how many impacts have the migrants had through these dialogues? On the first meeting they had, they had a proposal of 110 uh, uh, different policy uh, items that they would like to have changed. Uh, the second time they met six months later, they had 67 more. The third time they met, they had around 40, and they were also evaluating and assessing the level of, uh, of uh, how many of those uh, proposals were being discussed. You know, the, the government might accept it or might not accept it, but if it doesn't accept it, it has to tell you why it didn't accept it. Yeah? Uh, so these, these, in the, these could be an actual indicator on how the dialogue works, not only the number of meetings, the frequency of the contact, but also the quality of the contact, that is, the quality of the meetings, how the dialogue actually affects policies. A third, uh, a third indicator could be uh, what uh, Stepan was asking me earlier about money, of course. How much money is it devoted to this Institute of Mexicans abroad? Because now there is indeed a policy institution that has, um, that, that has a, a budget of itself to, to respond to. Is this money given uh, under which circumstances? Is it given to pay for specific services or is it given to pay the bureaucracy that runs the show? Yeah. So the, the, there are some indicators that one could use to, to assess this. Uh, but of course these are just things that I'm thinking now from, from, the, from my experience and as it is I don't even think that the Mexican Institute of, uh, oh, the, the, the Institute of Mexicans abroad has these indicators themselves. So yeah, maybe, maybe a good uh, thing to let them know next time I meet them. Would, would that solve your question? Thank you very much indeed. Yes, I got the response. Colleagues from Dushanbe, any further questions, please? No further questions. Stepan, thank you very much. Uh, Juan, muchas gracias. Uh, well, we, we, we keep hearing some funny sounds. Perhaps somebody pushed some button or something. Any other comments, any other uh, contributions? Please check your mics. Okay, we have no idea what uh, this is. Yerevan, Armenia. We know that uh, Armenia is famous for its huge diaspora abroad. Good afternoon, distinguished colleagues. Here is Yerevan. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you, it's a pleasure to hear you. Uh, I've got one question. Now, cooperation between compatriots uh, and uh, entities responsible for that cooperation appears to be one-sided. There seems to be uh, a hope or expectation that the government would help uh, improve skills, uh, would help uh, uh, improve the standards of living uh, of migrants in the receiving countries. I'm sorry, Tigran, can I interrupt you for a moment? Colleague, we, colleagues, we can hear a female voicing producing some funny sounds. Please mute your mics on all the other sites. 
We keep hearing it. Please check your mics. Ukraine? Is your mic off? Please check your mic. No, no, this is not Ukraine, it's not us, no. What about Kishinev? Moldova? It's impossible to do anything. No, 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 we are muted. It's kind of telephone conversation. Uh, we heard some um, telephone buzz and then this uh, funny sound too. So it's not us, no. Ah, it's gone now. All of a sudden it's gone. Shall we, shall we continue? Okay, now we have a lot of technical glitches now, but uh, hopefully technology will cooperate. Now, please go on. Okay, thank you. Let me uh, continue with my uh, question. When we are talking about those um, economic benefits that uh, donor countries may get, I mean, uh, uh, countries that send migrants, uh, we mostly mean the remittances that they send to their families. and. Uh, about 75% of the money uh, received uh, by the Armenian families from the migrants abroad are spent on uh, their family needs, and 16% uh, is spent on uh, health and education. I mean, if, for example, there is some kind of a problem in the family, uh, some uh, of the remittances money would be spent against the health expenditures. And only eight to nine percent uh, uh, of the remaining of, of the remittances are spent on investments. Uh, we in Armenia undertook some uh, efforts, well, attempts to accumulate uh, this money in the uh, financial part of the World Bank. Uh, undertook some study, and they discovered that. Uh, uh, nobody was interested in uh, uh, accumulating the remittances for mid-term or long-term investments in the country, like uh, neither families nor institutions were really spending any uh, efforts to um, attract this money for uh, uh, investments. And we wonder whether Mexico had any luck or any success in uh, persuading the uh, migrants and the recipients of the migrants' remittances uh, to uh, invest the money uh, in the country for something. I understood that uh, in general it was two questions. One question was uh, this uh, kind of imbalanced relationship uh, that is one-sided, give us, give us, give us. So on the one hand, for what I understood, is migrants demanding the government to, to solve their problems. Uh, and on the other side is the government side saying, give us, give us, give us your remittances. It's, 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 although it's a two-way street, both streets are kind of separated, and it's really one, two one-side streets instead of a two-way street. Um, for this specific item, again, the only way to, to kind of solve it is to go in little incremental steps. Uh, you don't have to go full, and again, I, I wouldn't even advise it, to go, you know, all in one go and, and have an institution created to, to resolve this from uh, one day to the other. Uh, the, the one, one of the main uh, issues that, that was successful in Mexico was they started small. They started with a small task force. And this small task force, as it went progressing, it became bigger, bigger, and bigger until it actually became a bureaucracy on its own. But it had to demonstrate some uh, level of trust and some level of success. Uh, in that way, it was actually uh, how the, the diaspora side learned that the government is not going to solve all their problems. The government will try to help and try to generate the conditions for them to help themselves, 
And at the same time, the government realized that the diaspora is not a piggy bank that, you know, it can take uh, cash every time it needs, but the diaspora is also a political subject that has needs and that has um, uh, concrete ideas that needs to be uh, incorporated in the decision-making process. So it's only through this dialogue that goes from very small interactions, very, uh, very um, specific and constant interactions, and then it grows into trust, and then it grows into, in, into something uh, more developed. Uh, now, on your second question, that's a content uh, question as such for, for uh, remittances. Um, for what I understood, uh, a lot of it is used for, subs for uh, subsistence purposes, and only between 8 and 9 percent is used for investments. Um, this was a case also in Mexico in the very beginning. And what happened is that there was no organization as such for these remittances to be sent. People would send money to their households, uh, either and not even sometimes via banks or via uh, money transfer services because they would be too expensive. They would just, you know, do you know someone who's going home uh, next month? Oh, yeah, okay, so here, have a pack of cash and deliver it to my family. So this kind of uh, service was the initial service. And only after... The consulate helped to try to, uh, or the Mexican government helped to try to organize this um, this system of transfers into something that wasn't that expensive, into something that was uh, not only affordable but also uh, readily available. That you know that the other person will get it uh, immediately. Uh, people start to be sending more money. Uh, the second thing that mattered is that uh, they wouldn't send money per family as such, but they would try to do it through the organizations. Uh, in this way, they could, you know, they, they wouldn't have to give the government the money itself, but they would give the organization where they are members the money, and then the organization would transfer it. You know, the fact that you're transferring a bigger amount of money or, or gives you economies of scale, the, 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 uh, the cost will fall, and the impact that this money can have is different. Of course, each migrant family would get the money that they were, that they were sent, but a part of it would already be dedicated to programs. And this part would be taken, um, th that would be the part that the government would say, okay, I'm not going to match, uh, every, you know, this infrastructure-oriented remittances, those are the projects that I'm going to match uh, the money that you send as an encouragement or as, a, as an incentive, the money that you send through this kind of uh, uh, programs, I'm going to match. The federal government would give one uh, dollar, the provincial government would give another dollar, and in Mexico at some point, uh, already in the nine, late 90s, early 2000s, also the municipal uh, government would give one dollar. So if you know that you're going to be sending one dollar uh, and your community is going to be given, is going to be given four dollars in total, then you know it makes sense. With the input of the migrants, a bit later, they enlisted private uh, philanthropic contributions from, uh, from uh, private partners. So they actually made it four times one. So they would have the migrant dollar plus four more dollars. The three levels of government and the fourth. And the first partner was actually Western Union. Uh, because, of course, it was good corporate publicity for them to say um, we're partnering with the Mexican government and the migrants and, you know, since they're using our services, we're also uh, helping their communities back home. And by doing this, uh, they again reduce the costs of, this, uh, of these transactions and they also increased the impact that they could have. Let's say if right now 7 to, 8, uh, 7 to 9 percent is what you told me that is used in these infrastructures, you know, uh, I, I'm not sure that the budget uh, of uh, your country might support this kind of uh, heavy investments, but if you engage the migrants to increase this level, even by two for one, uh, I'm pretty sure that it, it could be an interesting incentive for them to, 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 to move into this uh, into this. Uh, kind of scheme.
Стоимость такой программы нет оценки. What is the cost of such uh, program? Do you have uh, an estimate, like how much such a program would cost uh, if all the levels of the budget are involved in co-funding? So. This one exists, uh, and this one I don't have with me. Uh, but the cost of a program, again, the, the way the Mexican budget is structured, uh, the the municipal uh, level uh, is. Uh, very not very transparent uh, uh, that's something else that i wanted to say about it. Uh, the the municipal level of the budget is not very transparent there is a lot of um, corruption sadly involved in siphoning out uh, funds from from this uh, and uh, that's why uh, in the beginning uh, a lot of migrants didn't want to cooperate with the government. It was only with the guarantees that were given that there was going to be supervision from the migrant organizations and there was going to be supervision from the federal government that this might, that this funds were going to be used. That's, an, that's another incentive, supervision on how the funds are used. Um, that's when uh, it actually works. Uh, at the local level, it would be the communities themselves who would have an account of how much money their migrants were sending for this specific uh, programs, and it would be the communities themselves who would also have an eye on uh, how the, the budget was spent. If it's going to be spent in building a school, then they will know how much the painted cost, how much the bricks, how much the cement cost. You know, it would be a very micro-managerial task, but it would be done also in cooperation with the community itself. So it would not be just the migrants sending money and hopefully something happening. No, there would be some sort of feedback and there would be a, an open channel of communication there. And as for the, uh, again, as for the, um, for the actual amount, I don't have it with me, but uh, this is something I can definitely get for you um, and I will share it uh, uh, when uh, we hang the presentation on the website and so on. Uh, does that answer your question? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Juan. You answered my question, but as I understood, uh, uh, the, but uh, as I understand, there is no such experience that or lessons that can be easily applicable to uh, the other uh, to the other country. Well, but um, anyway, thank you, Tigran. Do we have any uh, further questions from Yerevan, uh, from Armenia? No. Colleagues, uh, I don't know whether we have anybody present in the Bishkek office now. If you are there, please uh, respond. Yes, uh, yes, it's Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. Well, uh, we uh, have to welcome you. So I have a question. Uh, what kind of a social, cultural policy did you develop when working with diasporas in addition to distribution of textbooks and other books in the native language? Um, another social cultural policy that, that, that was uh, applied, and to be honest, it was actually, at first it was a social cultural policy that, that kind of helped ease the comfort of migrants. Um, it even sta it started in the 19... Early 1990s, as uh, football clubs, the consulate would organize. That was the first way in which they kind of got the attention of the migrants. They would organize uh, on Saturdays or Sundays football clubs, and they would have m football football clubs exclusively composed of Mexican migrants who would have internal tournaments within their uh, within their circumscriptions, and that was a first way to build a community, to have the migrants meet each other, uh, to have the migrants socialize with each other and to have migrants organize with one another. A second approach uh, is that in Mexico we are very, uh, although it's one country, uh, we have very distinct uh, differences between regions. So uh, some organ most organizations are actually regional organizations, so community of migrants of Zacatecas or community of migrants of Michoacán, which are provinces in Mexico. And these provinces have their own traditions. Uh, for example, in uh, Zacatecas, they usually have beauty pageants. It's, it's a community that has a lot of beauty pageants. So they would have the beauty pageant of 
the daughters and wives of migrants. Or they would have uh, in uh, Michoacán, it's a country that has a lot of regional dances. And these regional dances are very popular. So Michoacán migrants would have regional dance competitions between different uh, clubs of these kind of things. And it was really these sociocultural activities what attracted uh, the, 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 the migrants to each other at first. Um, in fact, you know, it, we, we have a saying that if you invite someone for a chat on uh, education, uh, uh, you will get definitely less people than if you find people for a football match. So, uh, yeah, it was it was a way to try to attract their attention with things they would actually be interested uh, on. Of course, other kind of arts and crafts um, projects, especially for migrant children, uh, on Sunday, uh, as let's say part of kind of family activities to keep them tied to their Mexican roots, the textbooks that I've mentioned before, so that they would also follow the curriculum of uh, of Mexican education back in Mexico, so that they would miss on Spanish. Uh, they wouldn't miss on history of Mexico, they wouldn't miss on all these very specific things that we have in our Mexican curriculum and so on and so forth. Um, I, I, I cannot think right now of any more cultural activities, but really, those were the core at the beginning of, of, of how it all started. <laughs> thank you. There was a thank you in Kyrgyz. Um, any other questions from Bishkek, please? Any questions, if you have? No, a Bishkek is done with the questions. Thank you. Tashkent. Do you have anybody in the Tashkent office? It uh, doesn't look so well. Astana and Almaty, Kazakhstan. I am from Yelena Sadovskaya from Almaty. Well, it's a pleasure to see you, Yelena. I am mutually, I am mutually pleased. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Juan, for your great presentation. It was uh, really a pleasure to listen to you, although I was a little bit late and missed the very first part. Uh, but even the second one was uh, sufficient to see your systemic approach to uh, such things, and you were able to demonstrate uh, different factors that would uh, uh, contribute to the development of diaspora and engagement of it, um, economic, political, uh, even climatic and geographic uh, factors and historic ones uh, play a great deal of a role. I think it is very, very important to uh, take them all into account to understand diasporas. I have lots of questions concerning diasporas and policies, and certainly I would like to share with you the diasporas in Kazakhstan. And let me ask you several questions out of the um, all the questions I have in mind right now. And, and you may choose which ones do you want to answer. Uh, the very first one is about the Mexican diaspora in the U.S. You said that today it's about 30 million people, and certainly these are this is a very heterogeneous um, diaspora in terms of the uh, region of uh, origin and the region of destination. But I am interested in the citizenship status of the diaspora. How many of them became uh, U.S. nationals and uh, how many of them are still Mexican uh, 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 citizens? And about this dual citizenship, I, I wonder whether the U.S. Uh, uh, really um, uh, respects uh, dual citizenship, uh, and uh, please, uh, would you comment on that? And also, I would like to know what are the what is this what are the spirits uh, uh, in the uh, 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 Mexican diaspora? Whether they are really willing to become uh, U.S. nationals, or whether they feel like uh, get, uh, going back home? Because I remember a study I read about five years ago, and although the Mexicans uh, usually see the U.S. as an attractive country, still many of them uh, dream of uh, going back home. And 
and I also wanted to know about this uh, e about this uh, exponential growth of illegal uh, migrants so, and I and I'm wondering when we're talking about the illegal migrants are we talking about the illegal uh, employment or illegal uh, border crossing with uh, I mean like with false visas or uh, by some uh, routes, or whether you mean both, uh, illegal employment and illegal border uh, cro crossing. And although it's no longer a Brazil program, but I wonder where most of the uh, Mexican migrants um, work in the U.S. I mean, I understand it's not the all 30 million uh, or so, but the uh, p people of the working age, like whether it's agriculture or some or services industry, and about the political representation of the Mexican diaspora, like uh, whether there are any senators or governors, uh, uh, because that also, uh, I mean, who originate from the Mexican diaspora, because I believe that that influences the diaspora's feelings uh, quite a bit. And just a couple of words about our situation in Kazakhstan. Here in Kazakhstan and Central Asia, we saw a mass scale out migration in the 1990s. It, the levels are not as high anymore, but we still have some migration, out migration. People who migrated into Russia, most of them are Russian citizens, citizens, and those who went to Germany, certainly Germany is very strict about this, and so all of them got German passports. But still, they are our migrants. They are no longer. Uh, Kazakhstanis, uh, but uh, they are citizens of the countries of destination. And uh, at the same time, we see the migration diaspora forming at the, at the moment, those who are temporary out of the country. Uh, but although this is a not a very a sharp situation in our country, uh, because our migrants are all legal. We have a bilateral agreement with Russia, and uh, this agreement uh, uh, sets a framework for legal migration from Kazakhstan to Russia, and we have the multilateral agreement with the entire customs union, so uh, people can legally migrate and work, uh, be employed. Uh, we have a Chinese diaspora inside Kazakhstan, but whether we're talking about the migrants of uh, Kazakhstan in Russia or ch the Chinese in Kazakhstan, still the issues are not very well studied. I'm, I believe that we need to explore these issues further on uh, how that feels, uh, uh, I mean, what kind of adaptation processes are involved and how the ch young children or youth feel like when living in the country of destination. And just a very short comment about the discussion that we had about and the question that our Armenian colleague had asked on whether there is any experience in using the remittances for any projects. To finance community level uh, projects using uh, migrant remittances or nationwide projects being financed by remittances. And unfortunately, I haven't heard a single example uh, of uh, such a development. Actually, I asked our uh, colleagues from the Philippines, who are known uh, all across the world uh, for their uh, migration policies, and they said that they failed to launch a single program of this kind. I think I understand why. Uh, we're talking about remittances coming to poor countries, and those remittances are used at households to support their livelihoods. And you gave us some examples. I could give you some more examples for Kazakhstan, uh, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, and this is what we see from our surveys. Now, I have a lot of questions. Uh, perhaps I can submit them in writing. Uh, and I can email them to you. Uh, I want to ask you uh, how members of the diaspora supported themselves, uh, how well they are uh, knit together, uh, what is the uh, share of uh, legal mechanisms used by uh, the United States to 
regulate their aspirin interactions and uh, their own uh, instruments. Well, I don't think I should be asking all those questions right away. Again, I'm going to email those questions to you. And my last question has to do with institutional mechanisms to support uh, interaction. Not the first one to ask this question, I guess. I think uh, Kazakhstan is the third site that attempts to ask this question because uh, this is a very relevant one. Uh, it's important because it helps us share uh, our own experiences, our own approaches, and uh, t uh, it is also important because it helps us to uh, apply this experience uh, in our context. Now, this uh, Council for Mexicans Abroad, I wonder uh, how many consulate offices are there in the United States, I mean Mexican consular offices, are they located in each city? And uh, are there Mexicans working there? And uh, do those uh, consular offices uh, select Mexicans uh, to be on board of such council? And uh, I mean, how this is done? Do they get together uh, face to face or they uh, interact uh, virtually? I want to get some step-by-step -step, uh, description. Well, I saw your picture, uh, but you know, I'd like to uh, get a more detailed understanding. 30 million, that's a lot, and uh, it's difficult to ensure representation and articulation of all the issues that uh, migrants might be facing. So this is uh, one question I'd like to ask. And there's another question. Uh, back to the Philippines. Uh, Embassies or consular offices of each country would have uh, an ambassador or attaché on labor migration issues or officer who would deal with labor migrants whom Filipinos can turn to in every country. I wonder if you have something similar for Mexicans in your embassies in the States. Uh, I think uh, the picture would be much uh, clearer to me if I know that uh, there are many such consular offices all across the states. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I've been told that the connection will break in 10 minutes, so I'll try to cover as much ground as possible. Otherwise, do send me the email, and I will definitely try to get uh, your information. Uh, the email is in the presentation, and you should have it uh, somewhere there. Um, so, just to clarify the numbers, um, it's 12 million migrants, and if you extend the definition of diaspora to count the families uh, of, you know, basically the children born of these migrants a long time, it can reach 33 million. So, yes, indeed, it's a long-standing diaspora that comes from a long back, and, you know, it, it, it has an impact. From those migrants, do we have figures of saying how much are legal migrants and how much are illegal migrants? It's unclear. Again, getting data from migration in, in such a detail is, is quite complicated. Uh, as it is, again, Mexicans are not forced, and it's not an obligation, to register at the consulate. They may or they may not. Um, lately, uh, the government has had a program to, to try to, you know, encourage Mexicans to do so, but that, that's a different thing. Um, you ask how many of these migrants are American citizens and how many of these migrants are only Mexican citizens. Uh, most of this second generation migrants would be American citizens. Uh, so let's say from this 11, from this 12 million migrants uh, that are first generation migrants, not all of them will be, but most of the 20 million additional migrants will be. Um, the question also you ask is how does the U.S. deal with it? Uh, the U.S by its own composition is also a, a very migrant-oriented country, at least in, in, uh, in, um, in philosophy. It's what we call a hyphenated American. Hyphenated because, you know, everything is something slash or hyphen American. So you would have uh, Italo slash or hyphen American. Um, uh, Polish uh, hyphen American or Russian hyphen American, of course you have Mexican American. Huh? So uh, it does allow it 
culturally, uh, and it actually comes naturally, but you touch on a very, very, very important pro uh, subject, and I actually, it actually links to your question about Kazakhs uh, living in, in Germany, and that is, who is part of the diaspora? Are those Germans from Kazakh origin part of the diaspora, or are they lost? Are those Mexicans of, uh, uh, are those Mexican origin people in the United States that are Americans part of the diaspora or not? Diaspora is a psychological definition, and it's a definition of how you identify with your country. If you identify yourself as a Mexican, even if you have an American passport, if you identify yourself as a Kazakh, even if you have a German passport, then you're part of the diaspora. So it's a very tricky concept to play with. Um, and uh, it should be considered when you're dealing with this kind of policies. Uh, I know for a fact that the Institute of Mexicans abroad considers it. Uh, but again, specific numbers is very difficult to obtain. Now, uh, this also influences your other question. Would they want to go back to Mexico or not? Some people would. And in fact, uh, in one of the last graphs that I showed, uh, it actually showed that after 2012, with this uh, oh, oh, after 2010, with the credit uh, uh, crunch and with the United States going in, uh, in recession and in crisis, there the, the migration actually fell for the first time in, uh, in since forever, basically, uh, to, to, uh, to under 12 million. So um, some Mexicans do want to get back. Other Mexicans are actually being deported if they're caught. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's this negotiation, this constant negotiation between, yes, we need uh, this workforce in the U.S., but we want to have it done in a, in a, in a regulated way that, that is dominating the debate all the time. Um, where do they work? In the U.S., we have around, uh, we do have figures. I will, I, I will include these figures so that I don't go too much into detail now. But we have students, we have uh, blue-collar workers, we have white-collar workers, we have housewives, and we have other people who are not, who we don't have information. Just a proportion of students and uh, uh, white-collar workers, so professionals, uh, is around 30 percent. Uh, Blue-collar workers should be around 50 percent. Again, I, I'm, I'm talking out of memory, and I will put the specific information uh, together with the presentation when we, we upload it uh, on the website. Um, where do they work? That kind of answers the question. Political representation. Uh, although they can vote, migrants can vote abroad, they do not have a political representation at a federal level. They do have political representation in some congresses. For example, the state of Zacatecas is one of the main sources of where migrants come from. And the state of Zacatecas in the legislature, they have a migrant senator who represents the, the interests of uh, migrants from Zacatecas in the Zacatecas Senate. Uh, so uh, this, uh, this political representation varies. Zacatecas is really one of the, I, I know they like it when I say it, Zacatecas is really one of this uh, uh, few uh, states that have this uh, this figure, um, but indeed it's one of the m most involved uh, migrant communities. Maybe that also helps to answer the question of, 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 of whether it motivates uh, them or not. Um, I thank you for your uh, input on uh, the situation of Kazakhstan. Again, I, I see a lot of uh, similarities and a lot of common challenges um, uh, in terms of remittances. You mentioned that there is no big example at a national level. Uh, indeed, I don't think that there is a major national project funded by remittances, but the project, the, the involvement of this uh, Western Union, for example, as a partner for this uh, uh, fund matching scheme, is indeed a, a, a national uh, kind of achievement that, uh, that, that we can say uh, was generated through this initiative. Uh, when it comes to 
the institutional mechanisms of how they work. I'm going to switch really quickly to uh, to the website of the Mexican Insti the Institute of Mexicans Abroad. You asked me about consulates and how they operate. Each consulate has its own, let's say, adscription of uh, of the area of adscription in 2010, in 2011, 2012, 2013. And this subscription changes the, the, depending on how many Mexicans you have living. For example, in more densely populated areas like this uh, or like uh, this, you would have more consulates in less densely, uh, or here, uh, in less densely populated areas uh, with Mexicans, of course, you will have wider consulates. How they uh, elect the representatives for this council? Each organization decides on their own. So each consulate adscription calls the organizations present in these areas and they let them decide. You decide if it's by voting, open voting, if it's raising your hand, if it's uh, on a secret ballot, if you have to campaign, if you... All this, they, the migrants decide themselves. Why? Because they don't want the Mexican government to be involved on who they send. And the only support that the consulates provide is logistical uh, support on having that election. And later, when the meetings take place, uh, you know, financing uh, uh, the, 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 those who are uh, consul, uh, uh, council representatives to go to these meetings. And uh, the financing it goes as far as uh, air, tra air, air ticket to wherever the meeting will take place. Sometimes it's in Mexico. Uh, but in different parts of Mexico, sometimes it's where the communities uh, in different communities in Mexico. So it, it, this this uh, varies. And um, another question was: Do consulates have a person specifically dedicated to, or embassies have a specifically dedicated person to deal with Mexicans? Yes, it's the consular office. The 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 um, embassies that are only embassies. For example, in, in uh, Russia, we have two, we have one Mexican embassy in Moscow and one consulate in St. Petersburg. So the consul of the embassy and the consul of St. Petersburg will be in charge of uh, uh, dealing with the Mexican population, would be the official designated for that. And uh, in general, Mexican embassies, uh, the, 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 the diplomatic staff of Mexican embassies is Mexican. Only small position of local hires uh, such as uh, um, drivers or uh, uh, such as uh, assistants for administrative work will be local hires. Sometimes even these local hires are Mexican if, if uh, we have uh, the population there, but most of the times this will be local hires. And the diplomatic corps, so the, the consulates, uh, the consular offices, w uh, will be uh, diplomatic uh, corps of Mexico. So... Um, um, how is this done? I think I already answered that. I think I already answered that. I actually... And the rest, please submit electronically. Thank you for your The pleasure is mine. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Juan, for a most in-depth uh, presentation on Mexican experience, uh, relevant experience. Anyone from Minsk? The very last moment, please. We don't seem to have uh, anyone. Uh, Moscow, we have Moscow. But uh, we can do this uh, informally. We'll still have three minutes left for our connection uh, to ask one last question. Well, perhaps I can uh, ask about your forecast. Now, you emphasized the significant role played by the president. As far as I understand, uh, you have a new president in power. Uh, do you think this might change um, the situation or might reverse the situation? It has changed the situation, but again, uh, the, 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 um, the, the period that I count for the fourth era, uh, for, sorry, for the fifth era were two presidents. The period that I count for the fifth era have been three presidents so far. Uh, and indeed, the last president, the one that we have now, has uh, uh, called the council on the last meeting, the 24th meeting, so uh, they, they came together and in this meeting they decided that they would change the mechanism to, to hold this dialogue. Not because the mechanism, not not because the, uh, the the mechanism doesn't work, but because it has served its purpose. After all these meetings, they decided that after the dialogue and the trust has been established, maybe instead of having them twice a year, they can 
have less intermediation from the Institute of Mexicans abroad, and the migrants will have more direct contact with their key people in the ministries where they can where they can go to. Uh, so yes, uh, they, things are changing. The first year in which this will be implemented will actually be this year, so we'll see how the new system works. Uh, but overall, I think that the migrants have organized in such a way that it's going to be very difficult to to revert into into um, uh, a, 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 a pr the previous uh, way of doing things. The fact that they can vote now, the fact that they can have an impact on Mexican real policy, has empowered them in a way that uh, that they will continue to that they will continue to contribute. I hope for for many years to come. And something very bad had to happen if uh, if if it stops. That would be, I really think, a very, very bad sign for, for Mexico. But I wouldn't want to presume to, to foresee that far. Thanks a lot. I promise I'll, I'll, promise I'll answer all the questions in Moscow uh, because the connection is about to break. So. <laughs>